Hi, I'm Len Epp from Lean Pub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Alan Kelly. Based in the UK, Alan is an agile guide who helps software professionals enjoy more fulfilling and satisfying work by improving the way work is organized and requests are made. You can follow him on Twitter at Alan Kelly Net, and that's Alan with two L's, and check out his website at alankelly.net. Alan is the author of several LeanPub books, including Continuous Digital, an Agile Alternative to Projects, Succeeding with OKRs and Agile, How to Create and Deliver Objective Key Results for Teams, and most recently, Books to be Written, a nonfiction author's how-to guide to writing, publishing, and marketing your own books. In Books to be Written, Alan provides comprehensive guidance on how to self-publish a book using the latest and best digital tools available. In this interview, we're going to talk about Alan's background and career, professional interests, his books, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience as a self-published author. So thank you very much, Alan, for being on the Front Matter podcast. Thank you for having me, Len. I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. Um, So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up uh, and how you found your way into the career you've uh, made for yourself. Yeah. So uh, I'm older than I look, if you got me on visual. Uh, I was uh, one of those kids in the 1980s who had one of the early microcomputers. And you know, I, I just I just took to computers and programming, you know, at the age of 12 or something. You know, I, I just I just immersed myself in it. So much so that I ended up running the school's computers. You know, it's one of the times the time teachers didn't know how to do it. Uh, and I, I, at the age of 15, I started to earn money out of this thing. I was, I was able to write programs and send them in magazines and places. And uh, I used to write stuff for the BBC. The BBC used to broadcast my stuff with, with television signals and, and old technology. You know, so I, I really got into it then, and, and uh, I just loved it. And I've, I've, st- I've stayed doing that. Now, I, 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 you know, my career became programming, and, and for the first... 10 plus years of my career, you know, I, I was a hardcore programmer. And then somewhere about, you know, the turn of the millennium, I, I, I came out to California to do the dot-com boom thing. Only I got this dot-com boom game, dot-com bust. And uh, a few years later, I was back in the UK, and it felt I could make the code do anything. The, the code wasn't the problem for me anymore. It was, you know, the way we were being asked to do stuff, the way we're being managed, the things we're being asked to do. And so I, I kind of charted my way into this this thing at the time called management. Um, only I, I've ended up being more of a, a coach, a mentor, and and such. And that's where I spent the second part of my career. And along the way, I started writing books. Uh, I'm, you know, my first book was with an old-fashioned publisher, and it's printed. I've got copies of them there. Um, you know, I did a couple of books with uh, with uh, a real publisher, and then I discovered Lean Pub. And now I make my living, make a bit of money out of books, but most of my money comes from coaching, consulting, training. It usually involves the word agile. But I'm not precious about that. Um, but it's just been like an evolution for me. Um, that's really interesting to hear. Um, the the uh, that it started with a microcomputer, and I was I'm curious about that. So we've we've sort of got like our, our podcast has become a bit of a time capsule when when the authors are sort of you know people in programming or who were at one time in programming. And what's it was it? Did you ask for the computer, or did a, a parent bring the computer into the home? My next door neighbors got a TRS eighty. And I was fascinated by it. I just wanted to be. I just wanted to be around this this trash eighty. You know, I wanted one. So we had a machine here in the UK called the ZX eighty one, which is similar to Z eighty machine. So you know, I I, I pested it. Till I got one, and I I quickly outgrew that one. And my my parents got me a BBC. I remember doing big evaluation. Should I have an Apple? Should I have a BBC? Should I have a Commodore? Should I have all the rest of it? <laughs> um, but no. It was, it was the, the, the micro went into the neighbor's house and I got the bug there. Um, and uh, you said you, you said the BBC was sort of publishing your work. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? For a lot of people, I think they, they would love to have had that experience when they were a kid and get all the sort of positive reinforcement and sort of momentum that would come from that. Yeah. How did that how did that happen? And what form did well, that that take? Well, before the Internet. You know, people would some of some people had modems. They're really lucky, but there was a whole bunch of experiments going on in different places. To how do you how do you communicate? You know, and there was this technology called teletext, and the BBC version was called CFAX. 
And I don't know if you had it in North America, but you, you could pull up a text page and you, you put in a number and you know what number you put in, you got weather or you got news or you got the, the listings guides or whatever. It's a really a very simple internet. And the BBC worked out here that they could broadcast programs using the same technology. And the BBC at the time were really trying to help the country adopt this new technology. It was kind of like the BBC had decided it was good. So it was a BBC branded computer. And uh, so they started broadcasting uh, a bit of TV picture you couldn't see. They broadcast programs. And so that they needed raw material. And they put out, they put out a message saying, if you write programs, we'll pay for them. And so I started sending them in. And I get these checks by ten post. So I, I never had a Saturday job. <laughs> I used to sell them and they, they square to the mouth. Um most people couldn't see them. If you knew where to look, you could get this text page, very simple text page, which told you what was being broadcast this week and my name would be there on TV. <laughs> And when you said you sent, when you say you sent them in, did you like send them in like on printed sheets of paper? Uh, well, floppy disks. We we reached floppy disks by that stage. So yeah, yeah. so you pass up a, a five and a quarter inch disk, and I post it off to London because I was, I lived in Liverpool as a kid. Post it into London, and they would send a message back. The BBC loved everything I did. You know, some of the magazines didn't love everything, but the BBC loved everything. They'd send me back um, a, a physical contract which I'd sign send it in and this check would come back it all revolved around five and a quarter inch floppy disks uh and um so you made your way to university and you studied computing i believe well yeah i i did computing actually computing and economics uh i really got into i guess i had an inkling that way and yeah you know i I could already do it. it 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 was it was the easy stuff uh, I, I'd already passed all that, but I remember some la- nights in the lab till midnight there, hacking away, trying to get stuff going. Um, and yeah, I, I rolled out of that. I, managed, I, I got a brilliant um, internship, before we even called them internships, with a company that was making handheld PCs, which, which is nothing special now. But in 1981, it was. Um, some people might remember the Atari portfolio. So... The company that actually built that, it wasn't Atari, Atari branded it. The company behind that, a company called Distributed Information Processing here in the UK, they built that was the first handheld PC, and they were building a successor, which was going to be sold by Sharp. And I managed to get myself hired as, as an intern there. And I was testing this new handheld PC. And like, like every tester, we want to automate it. And the only way to test this was was to get down the not not even the IP, API layer, the BIOS level. And I remember going into this bookshop and buying myself a copy of KNRC, and I taught myself C that summer so I could write test harnesses for this handheld PC. <laughs> the PC was a total flop. You know, it was just it was just you know, a few years behind where it needed to be. But oh my God, it was the Probably the best job I ever had because, you know, we really felt as if you were doing something unique. And did you have to move to do that job? Um, I, I was lucky. By by then, I was down south in the UK because of the university and things, and I, I, I could get into their offices quite easily. So I didn't have to move for that. And then after I graduated, everything in the UK was London-centric then. Oh, okay. Um, actually, that's uh, just – it's a – a um, uh, bit of a coincidence, basically, but I, I lived in London for a few years and I lived in a bunch of different places. So what, what neighborhood or neighborhoods did you live in when you were in London? Well, to start off with, I lived outside of London in a place called Slough. Oh, and yeah. these, I, live in, I live in Ealing uh, on the west side, which most people pass through rather rapidly on the train these days. <laughs> but uh, I have a train stop there. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, uh, and so, uh, when did you find yourself getting into writing? I guess like everyone, I, you know, I felt as I wanted to write a book and yeah, I had had a few ideas. I, and, um, there's an organization which your hardcore C and C++ readers will have heard of called the association of C and C++ users, bit of a mouthful. Everyone calls it ACCU, A-C-C-U. And yes, it includes Java and everything else, but the hardcore C++. And it, you know, it was a user group in the 1980s. Again, the internet was just getting going. 
and they still, and they still today, publish physical magazines. And so I became a member, and I was reading this stuff, and it was all really practitioner. And I started to think, I, I, I can write this. So I started contributing my own articles. And the, the editor at the time, a guy called John Mills, he was really enthusiastic and he welcomed what I had up and gave me some great ideas. And I really got into writing with them. And out of that, I started to have ideas about a book. And, and my first idea was about build systems. Going through this phase in my career where build systems were everything. You know, God, if you can get a proper build system, you can package it and you can deliver it. And, you know, that that would have been Dave Farley's continuous delivery, but five years early. But I, I gave up on that idea. Um, but I really got into writing and documenting what I knew. And then um, I went and did a, a master's. And I finished the master's and I had this great big thesis. I just didn't want to leave it. I wanted to do more of it. And then I started about the same time. I started going to patterns, conferences. And the patterns community is really great because they support writers, they support pattern authors. And I started going out to this conference in Germany. I wrote I wrote a pattern, encapsulated context, if, if anyone's ever come across it. And um, that community was great at supporting as a writer. And I learned so much about writing. I started writing patterns about the software business. But I had, I had this thesis I was still interested in. And publishers used to come to Europlop, the, the Patterns Conference, and I got talking to them. And we started talking about ideas one day in the bar. And like a whole bunch of other people at that conference, I ended up writing a, a book for them, John, John Wiley. And that was really a rewrite and expansion of my thesis. But while I was doing that, I was churning out all these patterns about the business of software. And um, that became my second book. So the second book was already being written when I was writing the first book. <laughs> um, and the second book, I, I can see it down there now, it came out twice as big as the first one. Uh, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, that's it, never again. I've, I've written two books, I'm never doing this again. But I think I had the bug. <laughs> and so you didn't get in through, like, blogging or anything like that? It was just straight to books? Uh, I, I started blogging sometime, but I was already... I was already writing books. I was already doing stuff. I was already expressing myself. You know, I sometimes, I sometimes say, look, I'm, I'm from Liverpool and everyone in Liverpool has a big mouth. Uh, you know, if your North American readers don't know, you know, Liverpoolians are famous for having their say. I, I think I, I've got that bug and, and be able to express myself and share what I learned and share my views. You know, that's where it comes from. So, so I have blogged, but the writing came before the blogging. And the, the you eventually made this sort of move from, you know, sort of having jobs uh, and bosses and things like that to being kind of independent. Um, uh, did that happen around the time you started publishing? Was there any relationship yeah. between those two things? I think so, yes. I think partly it was a desire to have more time for writing. And partly, you know, my, my first book was, was about Agile. And at the time, Agile was, you know, it was just... In his first launch takeoff phase. And I think, you know, the, the book and being independent fitted together. I had more credibility than most people in the market. So I had this opportunity in front of me. And by going down that path, I had more time to do the second book. And um, so that they became kind of mutually supporting. Um, for better or worse, I, I, I miss sometimes being you know, in the thick of it with, you know, a real product and everything else. Uh, and, um, um, and so eventually you made your way into self-publishing. And I'm so I was wondering and that this is relevant to your latest book. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that how that happened. So so after the second book, you know, I took that vow. No more books. These things take because the second book was eight years end to end. Almost everything in the second book I've been to a conference, you know, and so no more books. I'm never going there again. And um but I was at a conference and um, I started to hear about Lean Pub and this idea that you could you could just write stuff and it would format it and you produce a book. And I had some ideas, some papers floating around, and I just 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 out of curiosity as I started playing around with it. And you know, and the first thing I discovered was like Markdown. And at first it's like, oh my God, this thing is so simple. What is going on here? But I quickly realized that for me. 
losing all that what is the font what's the font size what's the style what, losing all that stuff is liberating i don't have to worry about that stuff so i started to take to it from that point of view and i, I could put my writing together and i could formalize things and i could start to see the whole and Without really trying, my first Lean Pub book, Zanpan, came just came about. It was really a whole bunch of ideas I had that I was I was trying to. It was more for me than anything else. Trying to put these ideas in order and understand it. You know, the last thing I want to do is give the world another method. The world's got enough methods. Uh, you know, but I started to say my brand of agile is this Zanpan thing. So. I best spell it out, X-A-N-P-A-N. So sounds a bit like Kanban, but the secret is it contains X and P. Um, and yeah, you know, getting out of the idea together, I learned so much and it made sense and it was there. And I put it on Lean Pub. I didn't have any great expectations and people started buying it. And when you start to see the money coming in, it gives you more motivation. <laughs> <laughs> you feel like okay, I must make something of this, and the real problem with that book was saying, "When will it? Be? I need to finish it. What what is done? I need to draw a line under this because the temptation was always to add more." Yeah, that's really great. Um, we can we can talk a little bit more about that and how you know sort of you know uh, when money coming starts coming in, uh, you know that's a, a really great motivator uh, to to keep writing. I sometimes um, like to say, you know, money is the best form of feedback. When someone gives you money, yes, they're giving you a few dollars. But what they're also telling you is what you've done is worth me giving up something else. I am giving up a pint of beer, a bottle of wine, a theatre ticket. You know, they, they're, they're giving you that information. It's valuable to them. Yeah, and and uh, particularly if they're buying a book from you, they're giving you time and attention as well, uh, which is which is which is um, uh, really motivating and, and can be very gratifying as well. Um, just before we go on to talk about your latest book, um, yeah. I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, the pandemic. Um, so this is something that's, you know, we've been talking about for years now, um, but, um, you know, particularly because a lot of Lean Pub authors are people who uh, are, are independent operators, you know, maybe sort of conference speakers, consultants, things like that. Um, how did it affect you? Oof. So hold on a second. I need to turn my... I'm really lucky. Don't put this in the interview. I'm really lucky. Oh. I have my own office in the garden, and uh, but I have to heat it, and so it's gone from being too cold to being too warm. Okay. Um, okay. Right. Uh, back on. So. Oh wait. So hold on. Hold on. One thing. One thing I would say. One thing I've learned when we sit. We only. We only started doing video kind of recently. But one thing I've learned is when we do cuts, it's kind of important to kind of like pause for a moment. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just sort of like do three, two, one, and then please go ahead. No. Okay. okay. Three, two, one, go. So the pandemic. Uh, so <laughs> the pandemic for me started in a really funny way. Um, you know, if folks see the picture behind me here, um, this is the Agile on the Beach conference here in the UK, perhaps the world's greatest conference. And yes, we do have a beach party. The conference is, is in proper facilities, but we have a beach party. <laughs> And uh, it's a great success. I'm really still involved with it. One of the spin-offs of Agile on the Beach UK is Agile on the Beach New Zealand. And um, they, they this was like their, their second or their third run. And, and you know, I really want to be supportive of it. And I had a work-wise, I had a brilliant 2019. My 2019 came to an end. I had plenty of money in the bank. I needed a bit of a break. The client had been really intensive. Agile on the Beach New Zealand was coming up, so I said, you know, I'm going to it. So I, I booked I booked the plane tickets, all the rest of it. Agile on the Beach New Zealand is like the second, third week in March. <laughs> um, so this, this thing in China is building and building, and it comes to the day I'm due to fly to New Zealand. And I'm so I'm sitting in my kitchen with my wife and saying, I don't really know if I should be going, but, you know, the government would have told us not to go if this was really dangerous. And if I don't go, I lose my money. You know, uh, this is the perfect time for me to go and spend a week in New Zealand. Oh, my. So I fly off to New Zealand. Uh, the airport was already pretty sparse going out. <laughs> I get to New Zealand. 
two days after I get to New Zealand, they close the borders. Uh, we have the conference. I then uh, I, I, I jetted down to give a lecture in Wellington and see some people and things. And then I'm, I'm flying back on like the Wednesday. And um, the night before in the airport hotel is really weird. Wednesday morning, then there's something wrong with my, uh, there's something wrong with my, I can't check in online, it's weird. And I go to the airport Wednesday morning and, oh my God, I'm there early, but already there's, you know, panic is setting in. And I get to the front of the check-in queue and they haven't got my booking. And I discover an e-ticket is not as much of a ticket as an e-ticket, you know, a real ticket. So I had to go and force my way into the airline office and demand I go on a flight. <laughs> I get out of New Zealand, I change planes in Hong Kong. I, I think I had the top deck of an A380 to myself coming into London. And uh, I get into London, two days later we lock down. You know, so I, I just made it back by the skin of my teeth. And I'm like, okay, I was going to take a little break, but uh, the world seems to have turned upside down. Okay, I'm just going to cut myself some slack. Uh, I, I can afford to go. Well, you can see what happens. And I had these notes that I've been putting together um, with my client. We've been working on OKRs. And so I started to, to write up my notes. I had a couple of drafts. And so the first couple of months of the pandemic, I cut myself some slack and I was writing these notes up. And so you could say my, my pandemic project was, was the next book. <laughs> um, and then as the pandemic started to play out and the work was happening online, I started to pick up a few small gigs and I picked up some bigger gigs. But by then the guts of the book had been written and it was just like producing the book in, in the second half. Uh, but yeah, it was a weird experience. <laughs> Thanks very much for sharing that. I mean, we've, we've had, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, adventure stories, uh, <laughs> on the podcast. And that's, 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 that's a truly, truly interesting one. I mean, being, being, you know, sort of like, uh, on the other side of the Antipodean kind of, you know, adventure. Um, uh, and when I just, just, just before we go on, just one more thing before we go on to talk about your latest book, though, you said you were getting, getting gigs during the pandemic, like good yeah. gigs. So what, what does that mean? Like, were you like, I mean, presumably you were sort of like, did you have to go to co coaching and sort of consulting remotely? It was, it was all online, you know, and I, I, I'm a really physical person. I'd much rather do stuff online. And, you know, I'd always kind of put off doing stuff online. So most of what I do is around the, the kind of coaching, mentoring stuff. But we often kick off with some training issues, uh, training programs are. And a lot of my stuff is really physical. You know, I, I did a training session last week and, and people are folding airplanes and blowing balloons. And so uh, somebody I've known for a few years um, came to me and said, look, I, I really want to give my team some training. Can we do something and can we do it online? I thought, okay, well, this is the online world. And, um, you know, I had to think long and hard about how I reposition my exercises, you know, and I discovered that, in the same way as I get people to fold airplanes and blow balloons and roll dice in the real world, I can't get them to fold an airplane online, but there are things I can do online. You know, I can get them to play Minesweeper online. And uh, if you, you know, Google has a dice rolling app, I can get them to roll dice online. <laughs> and I had to re-engineer some of my training materials so it worked online. And um, then we start a little bit of, of coaching start to come through. And a few months in, there was, there was, I was, I was called in. There was a, um, a, a project going on, and that they want some more agile coaching, and everything was online, and it was really super annoying because this client's offices, if if I'd ever gone to the offices, they would have been the offices closest to my house. It's just like a ten minute bike ride that way, but at the time everything was online, so I ended up doing coaching and and, and training online, and. It kind of worked. Um, yeah, it wouldn't be my first choice, but now I've done it. I know when we need to, we can do it. And sometimes it's right. And just yeah, that, that that's really great. And the last thing I should add, actually, is just for those for those listening who might not notice, the kind of training and coaching that we're talking about is uh, programmers. Um, yes, <laughs> software developers, software engineers, things like that. That's the kind of software 
programmers um, learning to do things in what we call an agile fashion. I, I don't do the code stuff. I do the workflow and the, the, the management and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, yeah, but yeah, the sort of the sort of like, yeah, the, the, the way of the way of working rather than the sort of details of coding and things like that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, so uh, in addition to all of your your other books that you that you've, you've now written a sort of book about books called Books to be Written. Um, yes. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the origin story is of, is of that book and what it's about and who it's for. Uh, Steve Smith. <laughs> uh, Steve Smith, who uh, who has I think he's got three lean pub books, build quality in continuous delivery for children and um, measuring continuous delivery. So he wasn't alone. But I found that when I talk to people, I mention I've written books. That some people are really fascinated by it. Some people really want to know about this stuff, and some people pick my brains and. Although Steve had already done uh, a couple of books as a co-author, when he came to do his, his third book, um, he, I, mean, I, I talked to Steve regularly, I talked to him last night, and you know, he, he reached out and he said, can I, can I get a brain dump from you about writing books? And I think this was, this was part way into the pandemic, the six month mark or something. And so we were on a Zoom call for about an hour, and I could see he was writing loads and loads of notes. And, and yeah, I was talking about, okay, so so you need to make the images, you need the file size, you need to make your marketing. You know, and I was just coming up with all this stuff, and 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 he, he just kept saying, "You got to write a book. You got to write a book." Uh, and in the months afterwards, from time to time, he, he he would mention again, "Alan, you need to write this down." And I was like, "No, no." I write books about managing software development. I write books about agile. I write books about OKRs. I don't write about writing books, but still, you know, people here I write books. And uh, somebody else I've known for years, David Daly, same story. He 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 said to me, "Can I ask you advice on a book?" And he sends me over this manuscript, and he says, "We're trying to think about this part two. I'm like, "No, David, you've written it. <laughs> this is a book. You've got thirty, forty thousand words here. Just go to Lean Pub, publish it, and see if anyone likes it." You know, uh, and you know, I always say to people. The great thing about self-publishing, and particularly the EMPUB, is you still own the copyright. You can still go to a publisher if you want to. And I've been approached by publishers who've seen I'm doing stuff on LeanPub, and they come and talk, and one of them turned into uh, one, one of my publisher books. But the thing is, you can start pushing stuff out there. You can start getting feedback. You can start earning revenue, and you still have the copyright. If you still want to go to a publisher, you can. So I had the same conversation with David as I had with, with Steve, although it was much more publish it and be damned. <laughs> and uh, David went through with it and looked at David's book. David's book is a better agile, it's called. Fantastic book. Um, my favorite introduction to agile in the 21st century. Um, you know, so, so David did it as well. And then I was just, where was I? I think I was just... I was just at some local networking event, just chatting to some fellow small business people. And the same experience, someone's, someone's like, give me a brain dump, give me a brain dump. And it just clicked after saying again, again I am not writing a book, I am not writing a book. Yeah, um, beginning of last year, I just sat down and the words just flowed. You know, by the time I stopped and I looked, it was like two months later, and already there's like 40,000 words there. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's such a great story. I'm um, having having sort of books pulled out of you that way, um, uh, and and sort of like, but but having to pull them out of other people sometimes as well, because you know people can sometimes be kind of they'll 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 have so much to say, but they sort of sometimes need a bit of a push. Um, and that's one of the great things about 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 sort of self publishing is that it can sort of like. Um, it, it can sort of be very freeing, but you but you do have sometimes have to get over a bit of a a bit of a kind of hump, as it were. Um, and it, it's interesting that so there's lots of details we could talk about with respect to self publishing. We won't we won't go over the whole book. Everybody should buy it um, if you're interested in self publishing a book. Um, uh, but that uh, one thing one thing you've mentioned already is is formatting. Um, the official kind of Lean Pub philosophy is uh, formatting is very important when you're done writing. Um, for 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 ninety nine percent of book projects, there's there's there there is there is a certain type of book project where the formatting is obviously like un, there's a unity of form and content going on, but for most writing projects, formatting again very important ought to come at the end 
don't do it while you're writing. Uh, we, we the, one of the reasons we're sort of adamant about it is because we are the type of people who obsess about the formatting while we're writing. So we have like we're sort of like it's kind of like you know do as we say, not as we do kind of thing. But um, but it sounds like that's your your opinion as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're probably more obsessed than me. And I, <laughs> I work I work with a copy editor, Steve. He's 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 a great guy, uh, and I just hire him when I'm done, and he does a great copy edit. He would also love to do a full typesetting of my books. Uh, I'm kind of holding him back, and part of the reason I'm holding him back because he 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 did the typesetting for some of my my books with Wiley, you know. Um, part of the reason I hold him back is I had I had this problem today. I was looking at the book, you know. There is PDF. And then there's EPUB, and they look different. And if you look at EPUB on the Apple Viewer, it will look different to on the Amazon Kindle. It may look different on your iPad or your Kindle. And part of me just holds my hands up and gives up. I, you know, I think I could get something perfectly formatted on the Kindle, and then you'd look at it in in books, or someone would look at it on a, an Android with a weird size screen. So. Um, I try, I try and just keep my, my formatting simple. I don't want to get, I want it to look good, but I just try and not depend on any kind of complicated stuff. I want simple and to the point. Yeah, well, that's actually, that's a very uh, um, important point to bring up about sort of digital publishing, right? Is that um, particularly with things like EPUB uh, formats often, and Kindle, I mean, people, which, which is EPUB now used to be Moby, but you know, people can change the font on yeah. their own. They can change the size of the font on their own. Um, they, as you say, they can have different screens. They could have it in, you know, dark mode, what have you. And so, you know, one thing about publishing in the digital age is, you know, which is like, you know, it's thirty years now. But, um, uh, you know, there there are certain things where you kind of do. Like, there, basically, there's PDF where you can have very strict control over formatting. Uh, but if you're even if you're doing that, you're probably going to have other versions out yeah. there. Um, you don't. You don't want to be kind of open to this. is is an important part of that process. Yes. You you as a reader, you don't want to read a PDF. A PDF is a pain to read. You know the the formats you get on the the my my old Kindle and even my iPad, where you can turn change the pages and they resize them. Whereas PDF keeps the formatting, which is good. But as a reader, I want bigger font. I want smaller font. And PDF never quite works out. The other thing I'll add to what we've just been saying is the publishers don't get it right either. You know, I've worked with two different publishers and they both, for my money, made a hash of the digital versions of the book. They can do a print version, which is actually even debating, debatable, because they often send it to the cheapest location possible. But the the ebook versions publishers come up with from my experience, aren't any better than I can do myself with LeanPub. Yeah, I could uh, I could talk about that for a long time. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's um, just to think of an analogy. You know, uh, things have things things have finally turned a corner. It appears, but you know, for years, car companies would come out with um, you know we've got an we've got an E on the on the sort of podcast description, but car companies would come up with come out with shitty electric cars and then be like look electric car technology sucks um and this has been the case with ebooks and traditional conventional publishers for a long time they'll be like look 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 how hard it is to make them and look how shitty they are when they come out and it's like well that's cuz you you're you're deliberately being thick and doing it that way on purpose uh the rest the rest of us who know can see it right through you um uh and um you know, this, this, there's, and there's like a, the reason I bring up that analogy is like people in the conventional car industry have so much invested in the skills that they've developed and the techniques and the traditions that go back centuries and things like that. And it's, it's sort of understandable to some extent that not everybody can, has this kind of like, to, to put it in as loaded a way as they would have conventionally talked about ebooks, not everybody has the courage to just drop all of that uh, yeah. and and be clear eyed about what they're there to do and move on. Um, uh, and uh, but 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 uh, that's changing in the in the sort of you know book book world as well to some extent. A lot of that is the same. It's the same way with um, 
electric vehicles where it was just like you were kind of like forced there by the, the advantages that that technology just has yeah. yeah for me this is the this is the real meaning that we're digital you know i think for those of us who come from a technology background when we hear the word digital it's almost like why are you bothering to use that word it's, it's irrelevant and i realized three years ago that when people from outside the technology world use the word digital what they mean is their world now looks like our world those of us from a technical world, those of us who were programmers, we're used to like version control and things like that, being able to roll back and the machines do all the heavy lifting. And it's slowly seeping out into other people's worlds. And things like the way you can publish and distribute books, it's turned upside down by the fact it becomes digital. But most people still haven't worked out that that, because it's binary it it, it 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 can do completely different things and it's slowly dawning on other people a lot of it's because they can't leave behind their past they're, they're so used to doing it a particular way they're so used to being particularly done that way that they don't realize you can just leave it behind it's so it's so interesting yeah no that thanks for that it's it's so interesting to how, how we sort of date ourselves with the sort of preoccupations we address in order to you know object to right because i think that you know for you know people i mean i'm 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 uh older than i look too um and uh you know for people who are gen z um all of these these sort of preoccupations and things that we're like you have to get over the idea that like you know if you publish something first that doesn't mean a publisher won't be interested in it they'd be like what are you talking about like yeah you put stuff out there and then 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 maybe it takes off and you find an audience and then maybe some some company will will you know want to work with you uh, but the, but the very idea of being afraid that oh if I publish my my content myself first then some publisher won't be interested in it is just a completely backwards logic uh, to people who've grown up in a world where like you know just you you've been able to like what you do is you put stuff out there you take a picture of yourself you write words down you you paint something and you take pictures of it and you put it online what have you um, you know there there's there's so there's a very general I'm just saying there's a generational element to to all of this well, you know. Well. Well, one of the chapters, one of the early chapters in this new book I've written is entitled, What is a Book? Because, you know, when we were growing up, Len, you know, a book was a physical thing with a few hundred pages printed. And now we're used to reading, you know, lean pub books on our Kindles and our iPads. Is it any less of a book because I've got it on my Kindle compared to print? What is the makes of the book? Is it is it uh, is the fact that it's eighty thousand words? Well, you know, some books are like twenty thousand or ten thousand. Is it there's got an ISBN number? Well, I can buy an ISBN number. And I think the idea of what is even a book is an open question. Yeah, this is. I mean, this is something we could talk about for a long time as well. Uh, this this there was a there was a huge debate about this kind of thing in the early nineties um, uh, around like you know hypertext and 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 stuff like that. Um, and when people started sort of putting books online with like what, you know, there was talk about what's the meaning of a link, you know, like if I can, if I can, if I can publish a version of, of a T.S. Eliot poem and have a link from like, you know, some quotation to the act, the other text, you know, what does that make of those two texts that are now linked and things like that. Uh, but, um, you know, the uh, just, just to go, just to talk about this for a moment, when it comes to the very interesting co concept of like, what is a book? Um it reminds me of this sort of thing I have about the, the myth of incompatible talents, which is the idea that people might have that if you're good at if you're good at um, math, you must be bad at art. Um, uh, but there's the inverse, which is that if if you're bad at math, that must mean you're an artist. Right. And and there's there's a there's a version of this of what is a book. A, a book is an item that makes me a thinker. Right. You know, and there's a lot of people for whom like that's that's what but they they it gives them a certain kind of status or reputation or sense of themselves um and uh to people i to to me to me to put sort of people who are genuinely into thinking about stuff the idea that like a book is some kind of status object is just a kind of you know inversion of what of what they're all about but that actually is uh, that that whole that that's a really important part of the whole debate about what is a book because for a lot of people it's it's not about reading it's not about writing it's not about learning it's not about experience anything it's about having a certain kind of 
identity. Yeah. Um, and, and for a lot of people, the, 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 uh, that, that, that was sort of like fundamentally disrupted by digital, digital books because, you know, there's like, well, how do I, how do I show it to people? Mm -hmm. Uh, how, how do I, you know, and then there's, there's the kind of people who say, I really want to, you know, and like, I'm going to be very loaded in my, my sort of opinionating here, but like people who are like, I really need to have it in my hands. And it's like, well, I mean, there's, there's a great, I think BBC documentary years ago about like, you know, people who didn't have hands could finally read when they had screens. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, you know, and that's, not, that's, the, that's the kind of thing that like really, I mean, now I'm sort of working myself up here, but like that really gets me going when people are like, I really love the smell. Well, what about people who can't smell, you know, or like, you know, uh, you know, I just, I really, I really need to sort of like, you know, have a, have, have a, a physical thing. And it's like, well, what about people who can't afford it? You know, now, now they can read all the books that have ever been written on like for free. Uh, especially if you're willing to pirate, which we don't recommend, but you know, there you go. yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and and to be and to be like you know precious about these externalities again there's this there's a there's a unity of form and content issue that we'll just put aside but like you know uh which is very important in lots of circumstances but for most people you know just give me the words yeah yeah uh, and if it's if it's an if it's an if it's a like a, a dot text file that they can open on a computer they're like now I've got the Pickwick papers um you know my local library didn't have it and I couldn't afford to buy it, but now I've got it. Um, sorry for going on about um, <laughs> my, on my rant there, but you, you, you triggered me. Um, uh, uh, but one thing, one, so, so just before, just before I, we, we, we uh, maybe go on to the very last part of the interview where we talk about specifically about how you write and things like that. Um, one thing you do write about is Amazon. Um, and so mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. So uh, let's say you're writing and you've, you've got a finished manuscript and you want to get Get where, go where all the eyeballs are. Can you talk a little bit about what you have to say about Amazon? <laughs> you know, as a as a uh, as a citizen, as a, a socially conscious citizen, uh, I have trouble with Amazon. You know, in the past they weren't very friendly to trade unions. You hear bad stories about some of their labour relations. You know, they're, they're pretty damn competitive. As a customer, they're hard to beat. You know, find me someone else who you know has the range and the delivery options. As an author, they're a source of revenue for me. You know, I get, I get, you know, I get more money each month from Amazon than I spend on them. You know, I'm, I'm not living off my revenue set, but I'm getting more than a few beers. Um, you know, so I've got rather mixed feelings about them. But in terms of writing and publishing, there's there's nowhere else you want to be but Amazon. You know, particularly in the ebook space, because you know their their Kindle supply chain is brilliant. Yeah, um, you know, I, can't, I still got a, a physical Kindle I use. You know, it's a software, and the way of getting stuff on there, you know, it's just like so seamless, and they're great for promoting the books. You know, it's it's the place to go. And you know, it took my my concerns about Amazon meant I was a bit slow to go Amazon go to Amazon the first couple of books. You know, I was I was resting on there. Well people can get it on Lean Pub. And I make good decent money on Lean Pub. You know, and it took a while for me to sink in that Lean Pub may only be one or two clicks away. But it's one or two clicks that most people won't make. And once you're once you're in the Amazon ecosystem and the Amazon algorithms are realizing that people buy my books, buy your books, buy Dave Farley's books, and Amazon's recommending them. You know, and Amazon is very good at picking up on what people buy. And you know, they they really they really put a rocket up my my sales. You know, I should make more of an effort on to get into Apple books and elsewhere, but yeah, you know, I'm lazy. And you know, I, I'm say so, if Apple adds 10%, eh, it's not worth it. If Apple adds 20%, okay, maybe it's worth it. I think in the last few weeks reading that, I think I have been convinced to go to Kobo. Um, but I think I also want to find a, an aggregator. Um, but simply, you know, having your book on Amazon makes one hell of a difference. So I put my personal worries to one side as an author it's where you need to be 
Yeah, thanks very much for sharing that. that that's um, you know, uh, one of the uh, big debates in the self-publishing blogosphere is, you know, should you uh, put all your eggs in one basket or go wide? Um, uh, and the uh, going wide argument is, well, yeah, the more the more places that your your books are published, you know, and and for sale, the more people you'll find. The other argument is actually, but but and this is something you write about in your book as well, is that like a lot if you're a self published author, you're going to be marketing your book basically. You're gonna you're gonna be the one drawing attention to your book. And actually, if you could point everybody to one place, uh, particularly a, an algorithm driven place like Amazon, then you know, like if you can direct a big, if, if suddenly a few hundred people are buying your book in one day on Amazon, then all of a sudden, boom, it's like promoting your book on that yeah. day more, for example. Uh, I mean, once you're on Amazon, because the algorithms feed back on themselves, you, you're incentivized to put all your sales through Amazon, because if you sell through Amazon, it will push your book up the rankings. If you're pushed up the rankings, you're more likely to sell another copy. If you sell another copy, you're more likely, you know, and the 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 incentive to, to sell there and not put your sales through anywhere else is high. I, I feel a bit guilty, actually, that you know, <laughs> I don't want to give you a lean pub link. Well, I mean, no, I should, I, we should probably address the, the, the elephant in the room, as it were, which is that LeanPub is a self-publishing platform, you know, for writing and, and selling books. And so why are we talking about Amazon so much? And the reason is that, like, first of all, you know, LeanPub is a way of writing books. Uh, we do have, we do have a free, we do, we're a free, we have a freemium business model, but we also have, uh, like, advanced sort of features for people who, um, want to pay for, you know, a monthly or annual or lifetime account. So actually you can totally use LeanPub to write and produce eBooks and even print books. If you use our print ready PDF feature, which you then export to things like Amazon and we can make money from, from, from your use of LeanPub uh, and, and, you know, keep making LeanPub better, even if you never publish on, on LeanPub at all. We actually have something now. I don't know if you've seen it called LeanPub author services, which yeah, is rather yeah. new where, you know, if you've, if you've, if your book is 100% complete, then you can click a button on LeanPub and we'll help you get your book onto Amazon. And one of the reasons we do that is because that is where they have way more eyeballs than we do. Um, when it comes to kind of like, but 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 I guess I would say the, the sort of official LeanPub line is you make way more per sale on LeanPub than you do basically in, on any other self-publishing yeah. book, book platform. Um, and so if you are directing with with the caveat about what alan was just talking about how like selling more things can sort of help you sell more things in algorithm driven book play book marketplaces like amazon if if you are directing individuals to buy your book um we do recommend you send them to lean pub because then you'll just make you'll make on well, any given sale you'll make more on lean pub yeah, exactly. Um, the other thing LeanPub is great for is you can do discount coupons, and they, they're great for a whole bunch of contexts. In Amazon, you can only give – well, you can't target discount coupons, and you can only get in some of the discount features if you give them exclusivity. So, you know, um, if I'm doing like a presentation and I want to say to people, oh, you can buy this book, here's, here's half price book. You know, I'll do it through LeanPub because I can give the people I'm talking to a coupon that will work on LeanPub. I just can't do that on Amazon. Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, the, that's a, and yet another thing that I could talk about forever. But like, you know, we do we do have lots of features that Amazon doesn't have, you know, like the discount coupons that Alan's talking about. You can also um, create, you know, easily create bundles if you have more than one ebook that you want to sell. Um, you can also like sell your books along with arbitrary digital content. So it could be an audio version of your book. Um, video lectures, um, you know, things like that. You can actually just sell packages. So you've got your ebook and sort of uh, anything else that, that you want to add that's, that's digital as well, as well. Um, so there's, there's sort of, you know, lots of, lots of things that you can do on LeanPub that you can't do on Amazon, but currently, and, and maybe one day this will be true, you know, but you or won't be true anymore, but there are way more people on Amazon than there are on LeanPub. And we're, we're not, we're not, you know, we don't hide that or pretend it's not true. Um, and we do have a print ready PDF export feature that's made specifically for going on to the, the aggregators and, and other sites as well. And we encourage everyone who's finished uh, yeah. a book. I, uh, I, I use it. I use it. And I, I sell, I sell more physical books on Amazon now than eBooks. 
Um, uh, and so in the last part of the interview, where we just like to talk a little bit about the, the person's writing process. So a lot of a lot of that's kind of in, some of it's already sort of implicit in what we've talked about already, like with formatting and the tools that you use and things like that. But I, I'm just curious, do you have a when you when you get into a project, do you um, set aside a certain time of day? Like, you know, tell your family you can't I'm going to be in that room and you can't talk to me for these hours every day. Or, or is it sort of more random than that? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, as I think I said, I, I'm lucky enough to have like, my own garden office. So all through the pandemic, I continue going to the, to the office. It's a, a 20 meter walk from my kitchen door. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's, it's nice family separation there. So, I, I, yeah, I, I always end up writing out here. Um, it's when I'm motivated. When I'm motivated, when I've got the idea... I can just write. Sometimes I have to drag myself to it. Sometimes, you know, you know, pick if I'm writing for a journal or something, or, you know, I, there's a there's a chapter I feel should be in a book, but it's not a chapter that I'm motivated. Sometimes I have to drag myself and I have to force myself to it. And I do have to set time aside and I'm going to do this. But more often than not, you know, the ideas are in here. Sometimes the chapters are fully formed. In, in the extreme, you know, I, I will, I don't use my phone much, but I'll have a dictation. I, I'll, I'll talk into it. I'll dictate to myself. You know, the, the, the words will have been written and formed up here. And it's just a case of letting them flow through my fingers. So I, I don't have a particular process apart from just sit there and type. But I think um, so. One of the things I do say in the book, and I, I'm, you know, I'll, I'm really dyslexic. You know, I, I spent years in special schools, and you know, if you read any of my pre-copy edited books, <laughs> the full spelling mistakes and grammar mistakes, I, I, I can get. I've started to get quite um, bullish about this, shall we say? You know, I, I, I increasingly see this as a sign of diversity. You know, and and you know, if we can accept other people's diversities, you can accept my bad spelling. <laughs> um, but you know, so uh, I, I, I make an effort. I try. I don't deliberately misspell. You know, and I will go back and change spellings. But it's really just let the words flow out. I think the flip side of dyslexia is dyslexia can be very creative. You know, and I think that's what's going on. I've, the, I've got the ideas there. You know, putting into words, a little bit difficult, but, you know, I, I, I can type, I can, I can do that bit. Um, recently, I've started to change my style a bit. My earlier books, you know, I was, I would never finish editing them. I would edit and I would edit and I would edit and I... <gasps> The last two books, starting with the OKRs book, I start to pull back on that a bit and say, let's try and, you know, yes, write it, let it sit there for a day or two, edit it, but let's wait until we don't, well, let's not edit it five times before you move on. And particularly the new books to be written, I've tried to do much more of a straight through technique of get it down, give it a, give it a brief edit, and get more of the whole content there and then do an end-to-end -end edit. And that's worked really well with books to be written. I think it's also a sign of, of my personal confidence that I'm feeling more confident in what I'm writing. I'm feeling as though, you know, my voice is valid and I am not spouting rubbish. Uh, it's also accepting that, yeah, I'm going to make all those spelling and grammar mistakes. I'll get a whole bunch out of them. But, you know, Steve's going to edit it through after me, and Steve is damn good at his job. He'll sort it all out. We may have a few more conversations in copy editing, but I will get them through. And even if some of those things get to the end product, well, I'm awfully sorry, but this is who I am. If, if you want my ideas, you want my thoughts, you might have to pull up with the wrong word sometimes. Yeah, thanks very much for sharing all of that detail. That's really great. And particularly, you know, sort of, you know, how things sort of can change over time and one's approach to things can change, but also learning to learning to live with your own sort of talents and limitations <laughs> and, 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 and being and being okay with that. 
I and understanding yeah. that sometimes, you know, they, they flip around and you realize something that you thought was a talent, maybe was a limitation and, and yeah. vice versa. Um, I'll tell you, you know, um, I think it's three of my books, I can't see them, actually have a mistake on the cover. And this has happened both with self-published lean pub books and books that do with publishers, that the first book actually has the wrong bloody title. <laughs> I didn't notice that they that the first one, the title was Changing Software Development. And to me, it was always Learning to Be Agile. And inside the book, it gives that as the subtitle. On the cover, it says Learning to Become Agile. And I, I just looked through that cover so many times. <laughs> and uh, there's, there's a, yeah, there's a couple of other books have those kind of typos. I just looked through them. But... That is, I would say, I mean, I'm sure you know it, that that is an incredibly common experience. Oh, is uh, it? People, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, to, I mean, you know, I was actually, the, the last uh, interview that we published was with a special guest, uh, the sort of friend of mine um, who published a book on uh, punk music during Thatcher, the Thatcher era in the UK. Um, and he's, he's, you know, he's a, he's a cultural studies professor, you know, um, worked, worked, worked with an independent publisher and copy editors and blah, blah, blah. And like when he finally got the box with his books, with copies of his book, he opened it up to take a look and first page he looked at, there was a typo. Um, you know, we, we had something recently where there was a project that we were calling, we were, we did a big, a big kind of backend kind of, uh, um, project on on the lean pub uh, website uh and that and we the, the sort of main page for it was the lean pub pipeline um uh but it said pip line for like oh. six months um before anyone noticed you know uh, and uh, it's because you're thinking you're thinking about all these other things uh, and it's just a very very normal i'm you know i i use uh on gmail they have this sort of like sort of delay feature that you can use. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you know about this, where it's like you click send, but then it actually doesn't send it for 30 seconds and you can undo. And it's, you know, it sort, sort of seems kind of silly, right? Like it's sort of like a fake, you, you know, it's a fake send when you click send, but I would say like, basically like 90% of the time I send an email, I'm like, oh shit. Uh, and, but I only have that moment when I click send. Yeah, um, yeah. Then I realize there's a mistake in there or something like that. So anyway, sort of learning, learning to deal with that and learning to live with that, I think is a very important part of being an author and particularly a self-published one. Um, well, Alan, uh, so the um, the last question that we always ask on the podcast, if the guest is a Lean Pub author is, um, if there was one magical feature we could build for you on Lean Pub, or if there was one thing that has, even after all these years, had you shaking your fist at Lean Pub going, damn you, why don't you fix that problem? Uh, is there anything you can think of that you would ask us to do? <laughs> So uh, I've actually got a list here. <laughs> my so my, my my copy editor, yeah, he he he, um, he yeah he, he I have to keep that. I have to put him back. Hold back to I I'm I'm using lean, but it can't be perfect. And he sent me some final notes, including a whole bunch of things on formatting. And he says, "I wish lean pub would fix these. They look ugly." Um, my my personal agony is around images getting images the right size both in terms of how they present on screw on in the in the thing they don't take up too much of the page or too little and they aren't too heavy in terms of megabytes because that may hit your amazon fees and um you know today i was just wrestling with it that my, I, I've got the book up, and the image in the PDF looks fine, but the image in the EPUB for Kindle is too big, and the image in the same EPUB on Apple Books is too small. And I have tried, I've wrapped my head around the Lean Pub documentation the images a hundred times. And I, yeah, I, I blame myself, but I think it's also lean pub has to put up their hand that there's something in the handling of images you know is it millimeters pixels density i don't know what that images can come randomly just come up a different size and just to have well, if only clearer guidelines if not some tools to flag up and say did you know your image is really small did you know this image is, is adding five megabytes to your 
book. Yeah. Help me. Thank, thank, no, thanks very much for sharing that. That's that's really great feedback for us to have. And you know, like a lot of the times, you know, particularly in the self-publishing world, people are in a, you know, and people with the sort of programming world are kind of like, you know, solve your own problem kind of kind of people. And often often that means they're 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 the the best sort of customers to have, but sometimes the worst because they don't tell us. And and you know, we've had people go off and build like, you know very complicated solutions to things that if they'd only told us about, we could have sort of probably solved it simpler in a simpler way ourselves and done the work for them. But, um, uh, but yes, the images thing. So yeah, that's, thank you very much for that. That's something we'll, I'll, I'll sort of talk to everybody about, um, as you say, at least being clear about what to expect. Um, yeah. you know, so for example, if we, would, if we were just more explicit about it and said, Hey, by the way, you know, there's a million different e-readers out there. There's a different million different apps that people are going to be taking your EPUB or your PDF and, and loading it, loading it into and trying to read it on. Uh, those apps are sometimes they, they, they go obsolete. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, they, they change all the time. You know, um, what might be useful is if, if it was as simple as you had some guidelines for Visio and I use OmniGraphle on the Mac, you know, for the, for the drawing pack and say, if you're drawing an image in Visio, these are the kind of dimensions you want to be using. Uh, you know, it's, it's often just getting it the right size in the first place. No, 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 no. I know, I know what you're saying. And the, the, this sort of, again, again, the tricky thing is there's a million weight, there's a million apps out there that people use to sort of create, create their diagrams yeah. or their images and stuff like that as well. And so, uh, but, but that's not, that's not to abdicate responsibility. Like it's our, again, again, if we can just frame it better, like, images are tricky there's this sort of like the way you cre there's a million ways to create them and there's a million ways to let me get my finger in there there's a million ways to there's a million ways to view them those yeah. ways are some they're coming into existence and they're going out of existence and they're changing themselves and so this is just a kind of like yeah there's 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 no sort of like total right answer uh you know for the good reason that there's you know it's a it's a big world and there's lots of people doing different things um uh, but, um, but definitely like having more guidance around images and then sort of like, you know, again, yeah, like just some, some sort of better way of sort of setting and, and just realizing it probably just it's like, just at least setting the stage for yeah. it, uh, would, would be something that we could definitely do. We will not, not just do a better job of, but just do. Um, and so we'll definitely think about doing that. Well, um, Alan, thank you very much for taking some time out of your evening, uh, to, to talk to us about yourself and about your writing and about your books and your latest book, uh, Books to be Written. Uh, and thank you very much for being a Lean Pub author for all these years. Um, my pleasure. Thank you for giving us the system. It's wonderful. Thanks. <laughs>